This past summer, about a month into my fun employment, I'm trying to figure out what to do with myself. My brother suggests to me in an offhand way that I could go to Burning Man. At first, I laugh. I have the money, and I suppose I have the time, but I am a solo parent of two kids. Running off to Burning Man is not the kind of thing that I do. I had kids when I was 18. There are a lot of adventures that my brother has had that I have not. A weirdo college in Portland, festivals, a trip to Ireland, to name a few. The pinnacle of those events is Burning Man, that sea of debauchery out in the desert. I don't get to go to Burning Man. I'm not supposed to go to Burning Man. I'm supposed to be impeccable in front of a hypothetical custody judge. I am supposed to repay my parents who supported me emotionally and financially through divorce, depression, college, and law school. I'm supposed to be a respectable parent, a hardworking lawyer, emotionally present, and fully self-possessed. I do not have time to be a confused queer or a romantic or an artist, and I can do it all without needing another parent to share the joys and fears of parenting. But despite this anxious labyrinth of supposed tos, I do manage to let go and have fun. I have let someone close again. Queerness is a project. I write when I have the time. So fuck it, maybe I can go. The logistics come together. A friend of mine can watch the kids, another friend is running a camp I can join, I get my supplies together, I find a carpool. <laughs> After two days of travel, I'm there. When I arrive, a greeter at the gate tells me, welcome home. She offers a hug, which I accept, and tells me that the dust loves me and invites me to make a dust angel. <laughs> I do. The ritual is fun, but I'm reminded that Burning Man has 10 principles, and it all smells a little religious to me. I love the feeling of connection to something greater, but anytime there's a dogma attached to it, it stops making sense and starts feeling dangerous. See Jonestown, the Crusades, etc. <laughs> but I put all that aside and enter. The city is rising, built on a flat, dry lake bed. It's hot, but not overwhelmingly so. The dust isn't bad this year, but it's still everywhere. I get to camp and set up my tent and gear. My campmates have designed and built the Temple of Floating Compression, a tensegrity icosahedron supported by three pylons. Our art will be broken and repaired twice during the event, apparently the result of many people swinging on it. At the highest, one of my campmates counted 22 people hanging on it at once. They designed for like 10 people. <laughs> the next night, the sunset is gorgeous. The air cools off to a comfortable temperature and the intense light of day turns to a manageable gold. When the sun dips below the rim of the mountain, burners howl like wolves. The cry echoes around the city. As night falls, Burning Man really starts. Tens of thousands of bicycles covered in LEDs roam the playa. Hundreds of art pieces are lit up. Some of them shoot fire. Some of them drive around. Many of them play loud music. Hundreds of raves are happening all across the city. The noise and lights are overwhelming. A pang of fear rises in me. What if this is bad? <laughs> I actually don't know my campmates that well, except for our camp lead, but the camp lead is my ex, and we never quite had the conversation about how we felt about the breakup. Loud parties make me anxious, and I am still not very good at talking to strangers, especially if I'm trying not to vomit my entire life at them. I'm going to be here for over a week. What if it sucks? I book it to somewhere quiet. I take a quick look at the man, another look inside the temple. Then I'm out in deep playa, the area past the temple, out to the 50-foot-tall tapestry blowing in the breeze, out to a fireplace where I find my first piece of quiet. I find a person who says they plan on walking barefoot to the trash fence, a five mile hike every night. The conversation is awkward, but not that awkward. Maybe it'll be okay. I wander farther and reach the trash fence, a fence that keeps the trash blown by the wind from blowing out into the desert. At the farthest corner, I find paper mache aliens in a surreal landscape. I find an art piece called Why Not Human Food, which looks like a vending machine designed by aliens to trap humans, but if the aliens had only the vaguest idea of how humans work, the vending machine's wares included a crumpled bra, half a pack of Newports, and a piece of toast with an orange taped to it. It speaks to me in Esperanto. 
It's my favorite piece of art of the whole event. It's delightfully weird and decidedly unshowy. Next, I find the nose cone of a small aircraft fitted with a couch where I cozy up with a couple of strangers and stare out into the desert. The conversation suddenly comes easy. What is there to worry about in such weird and wonderful surroundings? I make it back to camp around one, overwhelmed and a little dizzy. I want to tell someone about everything I've just experienced, but there's no one in camp. Finally, one of my campmates comes back. Alex is a whole and complete human, but my experience of him is of a magical hippie that shows up at events occasionally with intense eye contact and weirdly insightful remarks, all while being surprisingly charming and outgoing. I like Alex. I ask him if he wants to chat. We talk for maybe 10 minutes about my day and my anxiety about it, and then he says, do you feel worthy of being loved? <laughs> what? I say, do you feel worthy of being loved? <laughs> yeah. Do you? No. And then he tells me that I'm worthy of love and hugs me, and then he goes to bed. <laughs> Shit. I knew that I felt like I was inconvenient to love. Like probably no one would be able to fit into my life given my other commitments. But I didn't, didn't know that I didn't feel worthy of it. My answer to Alex's question simmers in the back of my mind the next day. I go to the city center and find a volunteer job helping finish an art project. It feels purposeful and satisfying to work with my hands and take a break from my mind. When I finish, I'm starving and exhausted, but I don't want to go back to camp. I inhale two cliff bars and an electrolyte drink. Then I wander deep playa again, finding more art and more conversations with strangers. That night, I find myself caught in a dust storm 20 feet off the ground, sitting in a giant yak made of driftwood with a treehouse in the middle of it. <laughs> the the dust turns the yak treehouse into an island, and it feels like nothing exists except for beautiful artwork, interesting strangers, good conversation, and a bottle being passed between us. On Wednesday, I wander with a few friends, this time during the day. We find an archaeological dig complete with buried fossils and paintbrushes to uncover them. Only all of the fossils are penises. <laughs> We find 70-foot-tall reeds that give me that tiny being in a big universe feeling, like a bug looking up at the grass. At every turn, Burning Man delights, subverts, and surprises. It feels a bit like the giddiness, fear, and wonder that comes with falling in love. I find myself acting on whims, trusting that wherever I venture, the experience will give me something worthwhile. So when we find ourselves at the temple much sooner than we planned, I feel ready. This time, I know that this is where I should be. My friends do not feel ready for the temple, so I tell them to go on without me. I enter. People fill the temple with themselves, with memories they write on the walls, and with photos and memorials to loved ones they have lost. It's a temple to everything, but mostly it's a temple to grief. I find a space where I feel like I won't be watched and lay on the wooden steps. A deep sadness wells up within me. It doesn't make sense to me, but it's there. I sniff, I sob, and then it turns into a gut-pouring river. My brain starts trying to find reasons that I'm crying. I think about my previous relationships, my mistakes as a father, my uncertain queerness. Usually, I would tell myself that one of these things was the reason. But the temple tells me that this is incorrect. Words can only limit my ability to experience this feeling. At moments, I find myself pulling myself together and thinking, OK, that was it. You have other things that you're supposed to be doing, only to realize that I am in the desert, and I absolutely do not have anything else that I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's only Wednesday. I leave on Sunday. There is nothing in the world I need to be doing right now. So I cry, and I pray. Then I feel alone. The temple is full of people, and we hold a shared reverence. But physical touch means a lot to me, and I want very badly to feel that kind of comfort. And I think, oh, 
maybe this is a thing that I can share with someone. That kind of comfort would be a really nice thing for me to offer. And I stand up and look around, and I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> Social skills and my current frame of mind are not made for each other. And I guess I stand up and spread my arms a bit and look around, and I'm crying again, and a burner comes up to me. She's broad-shouldered, thick and strong, with cowboy boots and pouches at her hips attached to a leather harness around her shoulders. She says, are you okay? I shake my head. She asks, do you need a hug? I nod. She holds me. She holds me and I melt into her and bawl and I realize, oh, I am silly. I am not gifting a hug, I am receiving a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels deeply comforting and deeply important and I cry. A wave passes and I feel a little better and I think I have taken enough of this person's time and energy. I pull away. She holds me and looks into my eyes. Are you okay? She asks. I nod. Are you okay? I nod again, faster this time. Are you okay? <laughs> and I'm crying again. <laughs> she pulls me back in. She tells me she's there. She tells me that she can take it that she's got me, and I fucking cry. <laughs> and she's telling me that I'm worthy and that I'm a radiant pillar of light, and it sure feels like some hippie bullshit, <laughs> but maybe just for the moment I can believe that it's true. Maybe I won't gag at the idea of me as a radiant pillar of light. Maybe I can embrace that without judging it. There's maybe a couple more times when I try to break away and she knows that I haven't had enough. <laughs> Finally, after what feels like a very long time, I feel better. There isn't anything more in me. She tells me again that I'm worthy. And somehow, in the desert, surrounded by outlandish art and so many people and all of the costumes and strangeness, my usual self-deprecating cynicism melts into the background. I don't deflect. She puts an enamel pin in my hand and hugs me one last time and then wanders off. It feels weirdly appropriate that this will probably be the, our only interaction in our entire lives. An opportunity for her to give a gift, an opportunity for me to receive one. I give the temple a few more moments reverence and for a minute I'm unsure whether to stay or go. Then I hear New Orleans jazz coming from outside. Just like the temple told me to stay, now it tells me to go. I wipe my eyes and go outside, and an art car approaches the temple at two miles per hour with a live jazz band on it. I join the crowd that has been following the jazz car and slowly realize that I have just joined a funeral. So I join a funeral. As someone speaks about the man being remembered, the temple holds the speaker's sorrows. It reflects back his joys. In a few days, the temple will burn and all of our sorrows will become smoke in the air, released from our hearts so that we can move on to new things. I don't know what I believe in exactly, but I know that in my stubborn fault finding with every particular religious doctrine I've ever encountered, I've left myself a life without a temple and I want one. Jesse O'Sullivan! Yeah.